Hello again, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video where today we'll be addressing a claim I've seen multiple moon landing skeptics make. That apparently the Earth in the Apollo photos is the wrong size. And so that must mean that the photos were taken in a studio on Earth rather than on the moon. Now, I'll let you into a little secret. They were taken on the moon. So we'll look into what is giving skeptics the impression that the Earth in the photos is the wrong size, and then we'll go through a detailed breakdown of why it's actually the exact size that we would expect to see. And afterwards, if you've enjoyed learning about all of that, then perhaps you would enjoy checking out one of my favourite places for learning new things, which is Brilliant.org. I've been using Brilliant now pretty much every day for about two months. In fact, I'm currently on a 32-day continuous streak and I've completed over 40 of their classes, although they still have a few hundred more for me to work through, on a whole range of math, science and computing. I'm onto their courses in classical mechanics now. I particularly like their animations and explanations that make the concepts very easy to understand regardless of your education level. So if you enjoy learning like I do, then why not take their whopping 30-day free trial by heading there via my link, brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan, and if you're one of the first 200 people to do so, then you can get 20% off their annual premium subscription. Now, when it comes to the apparent sizes of objects, there are a few variables. An obvious one being the distance that the object is away from us. And as an object gets further away, its angular size gets proportionally smaller. So if we double the distance away, then the angular size will half. Another obvious variable is the size of the object to begin with. The larger an object is, then the larger it will appear at any given distance. So in the case of the Earth and the Moon, the distance between them does vary by around a 13% margin over the course of a year, but on average, they're about 238,000 miles apart. And obviously that works both ways here. You know, whether you're on the Earth looking at the Moon or you're on the Moon looking at the Earth, at any given moment in time, you'd be the same distance apart. Now, in terms of the size of the Earth, it has a diameter of 7,917 miles, whereas the Moon's diameter is only 2,159 miles. So the Earth is about three and a half times wider than the Moon. And this is pretty much where skeptics seem to stop looking at the variables and jump into drawing conclusions. Because they say things like the Earth should look three and a half times larger than the Moon in the photos, but it doesn't and it only looks about the same size as we see the moon, so therefore it must be fake. Unfortunately, they seem to be overlooking a crucial variable, which is that they are comparing what their eyes are seeing to what a camera is seeing. Now, human eyes always see the same general field of view, but the field of view that a camera will see varies drastically depending on the focal length and the camera in question. Now, in layman's terms, think of focal length as a distance between the sensor to the lens's point of convergence, which is where all of the light intersects and causes the images out the back to be inverted. The longer the focal length, then the narrower the angle of view that we're seeing. The shorter the focal length, the wider the angle of view. But the angle of view is not universally linked to specific focal length. It depends on the size of the camera's sensor. The lens is designed to project an image circle that's slightly larger than the size of the sensor that it's designed to work with. So if a camera has a smaller sensor, then a specific physical focal length for that camera will project a narrower angle of view than the same focal length designed for a larger sensor. This brings about what is known in photography as crop factor or effective focal length which helps us calculate what physical focal length you need to use on any given sensor size to be able to mimic the look of a different focal length on a different sensor size. With 35mm full frame cameras being used as the benchmark with a crop factor value of 1. For example, the Nikon P1000 is advertised as having a focal length range of 24 to 3000 millimeters, But that isn't the physical focal length of that lens. The physical focal length for it is 4.3mm to 539mm. 
24 to 3000 is just what lens hypothetically you would have to fit onto a 35mm full frame camera in order to produce the same fields of view because the Nikon P1000 sensor is about 30 times smaller than a full frame. And all of this is relevant to the moon, I promise. All the Apollo photos used the same camera setup for photographing on the lunar surface. They used the grey data camera that was produced by Hasselblad, derived from their 500C model, and all were fitted with a 60mm f5.6 lens that was produced by Zeiss specifically for that moon camera. You couldn't use that lens on any other camera, not even a regular 500C. And the film in the camera was 70mm film with a negative area of 53mm by 53mm. And using a 60mm lens on that produces a 47 degree by 47 degree field of view. Now we can't produce exactly that field of view with a regular camera because they don't use square sensors. But a 28mm lens on a full frame camera produces a vertical field of view of 46.4 degrees which is almost exactly the same as the Apollo photos. And here is a photograph that I took of the moon a while back at 28mm. And you can see the moon looks tiny. In fact, if we overlay this onto the Earth in the Apollo photos and we match the vertical angle with the view of the film, we can see we can fit three and a half moons across the Earth, which is what we should be seeing. Now, this might not be exactly accurate in terms of scale because the actual focal length of lenses is rarely what they're advertised as. They're usually a couple of percent plus or minus. Manufacturers just round the figure to the nearest common focal length for simplicity. So there can be some slight variations between what we are seeing versus our calculated crop factor conversion, but this is a very small margin of error. And we can also check it against other Apollo shots of Earth, such as the Earthrise photo during Apollo 8. This image was taken with a 250mm lens on the Hasselblad camera, which gives us a full frame effective focal length of 170 millimeters. Both have a horizontal field of view of exactly 12.1 degrees. So here's a photograph that I took the other night of the moon at, well, as close to 170 millimeters as I could get. Now, if we take that image and overlay it horizontally over the Earthrise photograph and then duplicate the moon, we can fit about three and a half moons across the Earth, which is the sort of size we should be expecting. Again, might not be exactly 100% accurate, but it certainly confirms that the Earth in the Apollo photos is actually the sort of size we should expect it to be, and not the size of the moon as skeptics claim. Seems they overlook just how wide-angled the Apollo cameras really were it was much wider than what the human eye sees. It's often said that what we see by eye is what you get from about a 50mm lens on a full frame camera, which is why 50mm is regarded as a standard focal length in photography. The Apollo cameras are seeing a much shorter focal length than that, which changes the perspective. You can actually see it in this image that I put together, which is a combination of photos AS17-134-2. 20473 and 20475, which is Gene Cernan standing next to the lunar rover while the antennas pointed straight towards Earth in the background. And from here, the camera on the rover looks huge compared to Cernan. And yet, you can tell from other angles, it's not. This is merely due to the perspective of a wide angle lens being proportionally much closer to the rover's camera than to Cernan in the background. The only way that we can draw accurate conclusions about the relative sizes of objects in photographs is to ensure that we account for the fields of view as well, because wider fields of view will make objects appear smaller than narrower fields of view do. Well, that's going to conclude it for this video. Once again, thank you to Brilliant.org for sponsoring this video, and don't forget to check out their offer below. If you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and then hopefully, We'll see you in the next video.